Hey, good to see you all. <clears throat> Selena and I were uh, pretty young when we got married. It was between my uh, it was at Christmas time and in our junior year of college. And around that same time, we started feeling that God was calling us to go do a mission, to be missionaries. And so about six months after we got married, we headed to Indonesia for a year. And I knew nothing about Indonesia before this experience. It, you don't hear about it that often because it's, it's a long ways away and it's about five big islands, but there's actually about 30,000 islands that make up Indonesia. And it's about the size of the United States, the way it's spread out. And we got there and everything was different. Different language, different food, different weather, shopping was different. Some of the first words we learned in Indonesian were shopping words. Brap, how, how much is it? And, and then mahal skali, that means very expensive. And if you don't bargain, you get ripped off every time, at least we did. So we, we learned uh, to adapt to a very, very different culture. And, and it, was, it was lonely sometimes for us because we didn't really know any other Americans and we couldn't speak the language very good. We were there teaching conversational English. People, we had students paying to learn English and then we'd try to do free Bible classes to share the gospel with them. But we got lonely, we got bored. I'll tell you how bored we got. I bet you, you've never done this. If you have, you've been bored. We made crossword puzzles for each other. <laughs> and then she had to do mine, I had to do hers. That's, that's getting pretty bored, wouldn't you say, if you're doing that? <clears throat> and uh, Christmas came along and and Celine loves Christmas, and there was no Christmas trees in Indonesia. So she made one out of cardboard and painted it green and made homemade ornaments to hang on it. And, and we had to uh, send cassette tapes back and forth to our family because it was too expensive to call. And a couple times we tried to call, and it was just echoing, and you could hardly hear. It was like two bucks a minute, and we weren't making any money. So we got, we got homesick over there. And I wrote a, a song about it called Homesick for Heaven. And I was thinking about singing it to you, and my wife told me to think again about that. So <laughs> thank you for protecting me, babe. <clears throat> so I just want to share the lyrics with you, okay? Almost 14,000 miles from home, far away, feeling all alone. Missionaries in another land, working for the master best we can. But sometimes we get homesick, missing family and friends. When we do, we go to Jesus. He understands the way we feel. He came all the way from heaven to earth, became a man, and showed us how to live. The people hated him and nailed him to a tree, but he gave his life willingly. And he must have got homesick, missing those who loved him most. But he gave it all up for us. What will we give up for him? I'm homesick for heaven. This old world is not my home. I can't wait to go to heaven, and I know it won't be long. That's the chorus that repeats a couple times. I know you're wishing I sang it to you. <laughs> but you know, the, the expressions of that song is really something that's been on the heart of God's people throughout history. The people of God have always struggled with this reality of being dual citizens, longing for a better country, a true home. Hebrews 11 is called the faith chapter, and it talks about all these heroes of the faith. We were just singing about how we're gonna, all going to gather generations and generations of believers to, to sing worthy as the Lamb. It's, it's, that's going to be amazing. But it says there in Hebrews 11 that uh, these people, it's a long list of, of characters from the Old Testament. It says these people admitted that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. If they'd been thinking about the country they left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he's prepared a city for them. This idea of, of longing for something better, for, for God's kingdom. What about you? Are you focused only on this life? Uh, on being successful, on getting stuff, collecting toys? Or are you also longing for a better country, a heavenly one. 
This idea of living as a foreigner or an alien or an exile or a stranger in the land is a theme here in 1 Peter. We're, we're in a series on 1 Peter, as you heard. And the very first verse, chapter 1, verse 1, he says, I'm writing to exiles. And then in chapter 1, verse 17, he says, live out your time as foreigners here. And today we pick it up in chapter 2, verse 11, and notice he says, Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. He says, live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Followers of King Jesus have become members of his kingdom, have become citizens of his kingdom. And that's where our first loyalties lie. We're dual citizens, as I said, because we're still living in the kingdom of this world at the same time. So that means sometimes there's going to be tension. But that also means that, that followers of Jesus are going to live lives that are different from non-followers of Jesus. And I'm titling this message, Living Out Faith in a Hostile World. How do we do that? Well, the first thing he says to do here is to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your souls. He, he, he says, you are now called to live a different kind of a life than you lived before you put your trust in Jesus. Now, I want you to remember something here because initially this was a letter that was intended to be read out loud in the house churches all over northern Turkey, and it was to be read in one setting usually, you know, just read right through. And so we're picking it apart week by week here, and I don't want you to forget the fact that he starts out at the very beginning talking about the gospel of grace in Christ Jesus, what is already finished, what is already perfect, what is done for us that we can never accomplish for ourselves. And so now these appeals to live a God-honoring life are in the context of responding to the gospel, not trying to achieve some kind of, of favor from God. It's always important to remember that in the New Testament, the exhortations to live moral lives are always, always, always set in the context of responding to the gospel. It's not how we achieve our salvation. It's how we react to our salvation. Holiness is the fruit, not the root of our salvation. The root is what Jesus has done for us in the gospel. And Peter is going to keep coming back to it, including in this passage we're looking at today. That's the context. So he reminds believers they've been delivered from their past life of, of godless style living. And in case you want to know how he defines that, over in chapter 4, he says this in uh, verses three and four. For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do. Now he's talking to believers who used to be living like this. He says, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. Wow, that's quite a list, wouldn't you say? And, and this is how they were living. But it, and he goes on to say, they, that's the people who live that way, are surprised that you do not join them in their reckless wild living and they heap abuse on you. Now, this, this is a very relevant book for us today. It's not just for the first century Christians. He says, you used to live one way, and now as citizens of God's kingdom, you live a different way. You're different. And unbelievers might think that makes you strange. They're surprised, he says, that you don't join them in what they're doing. They even, may even make fun of you. They may heap abuse on you, he says. But it matters how you live because your life is a witness. Now, Peter's going to keep coming back to this over and over. Your life is a witness. Your life, it, you know, it might be the only Bible some people are, are reading. Just looking at you. They're finding out something. You're an advertisement for Christianity or not an, a, an advertisement. And, and that's why Jesus said, let your light shine so that people will see your good deeds and then they will glorify God. Let, let your light shine. Jesus said it's important how you live because you're an advertisement. Now, he says they, they, they may accuse you. They, they, uh, back here, he said um, in this verse, live such good lives. This is back to, to uh, chapter 2, verse 12. Live such good lives among the pagans that although they accuse you of doing wrong. Now, they were accusing the believers of a lot of things in the first century. 
They were accusing, Nero in a few years is going to accuse them of starting a fire and he's going to use it as excuse to persecute Christians. But they called them all kinds of stuff. They called them atheists because they didn't collect or worship idols. They called them cannibals because they heard they supposedly ate the body of Christ in communion. They called them out for damaging other people's business because, you know, like in Ephesus, the silversmiths lost business when so many people became Christians and weren't buying their little idols anymore. They accused them of breaking up families because sometimes that happened due to faith. They accused them of turning slaves against their master. Most of all, they accused them of being disloyal to Caesar, the emperor, because Christian's creed was Jesus is Lord. Christ is Lord, not Caesar. Now today, again, Christians are accused of many things. Peter's message is especially relevant to us today as we seek to live out our faith in uh, an increasingly hostile environment. Think about this. For 1,700 years, Christianity was the majority view in Western countries. Beginning with the conversion of Constantine in the year 312, that changed everything. Christians, Christianity was now legal. It was the religion of the empire. And that, <clears throat> that culture continued in Western countries for a long, long time. But in recent decades, there's been a change. And if you visit Europe today, there's a lot of beautiful cathedrals that you go to look at the art in. But many of them are practically empty during worship times. Europe has become a post-Christian culture, and America is on a fast pace to catch up. We're becoming a post-Christian culture. What's the answer? I reflected deeply on this verse this week. In fact, for several weeks, when I first decided to start preaching through Peter, I, I knew this, is, this was going to be a theme verse right here. Live such good lives among the pagans... That though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. People are watching. What is the answer to this post-Christian culture drift we've been on? Is it politics? Is it getting the right candidates in office? Is it arguing harder our positions? Is it winning debates and elections? Is it to make America great again? I submit to you that what we need today is not to make America great again, but to make Christianity contagious again. Amen. Amen? It was contagious for the early church. It was contagious as it spread rapidly across the Roman Empire. And so I want us to think about this, particularly in the, in the light of the division that's in our country right now. Are we, are we doing this? Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Our country has never been as divided as it is since I can remember in my lifetime. And of course, we all know that during the pandemic, everything became political. Everything. Closing schools, opening schools, closing churches, opening churches. Masks, no masks, vaccinations, and of course, Dr. Fauci. People either hate him or love him, depending on their politics, it seems. It's fine if you have strongly held opinions, but when you use your platform, whatever it is, and we all have one these days, it seems, when you use your platform to make fun of people or blast people you don't agree with, how are you going to fulfill this command. Live such good lives among the pagans, people who do not believe like you do, but need Jesus. And they're looking at you and evaluating Jesus because of you and me. Live such good lives among pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Seriously, is your opinion more important than your witness? Which is more important, to save America or to save Americans? Followers of Jesus, and I believe healthy churches, are more interested in winning people 
than elections. There's nothing wrong with winning elections, and, and yet if your behavior unnecessarily alienates lost people, you're winning the wrong battle. When, when you walk into the, the doors of this church, and this isn't true with all churches, but when you walk in the, the doors of this church, you come here to worship Jesus, to, to focus on him, to learn more about him. And it does not matter whether you are a Republican, a Democrat, an Independent, a Libertarian, or whatever else, other label you might slap on yourself. We are not here to take sides. That's not the purpose of this gathering. There's other gatherings for that. Vote your conscience every time you get a chance, but keep in mind that Jesus is more concerned about your witness to unbelievers than your political convictions. I read a, a book recently that I highly recommend. It's a, it's a small book, it's a fast read, but it's, it's powerful, I think. It's by Andy Stanley, well-known pastor and author, <clears throat> and it's called Not In It to Win It, Why Choosing Sides Sidelines the Church. In the last election in our country, we all know that you know, the, the, the vote was almost 50-50 split, right? And even though some of us didn't like either option we had to choose from, nevertheless, that's, that's the reality. And so if our church would become vocally aligned with a, politically, a political party, we would basically say, be saying, we're going to write off half the country that desperately need to hear and receive the gospel. And so we're not going to do that. I agree with this statement by Andy Stanley. When the local church becomes preoccupied with saving America at the expense of saving Americans, it has forgotten its mission. Just think about that. Read the New Testament. The message of the New Testament was not, let's overthrow Roman occupation. Now, there were people preaching that at that time, but not the ones that wrote the Bible. It was not, let's make Israel great again. What it was, was a determination to proclaim the gospel of Christ Jesus to as many as possible and remove every barrier possible short of sin so that as many as possible could receive the good news. Paul said, I'm determined to preach nothing among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's the message of the New Testament. Christians are subjects of a king, King Jesus, citizens of heaven, ambassadors for his kingdom, and that makes churches embassies. Now, because of that, our allegiance to God must come first. If you're a follower of Jesus, if you're not, I'm glad you're here, and I hope you do become a follower of Jesus soon. Keep, keep checking it out. Keep coming. If you're a follower of Jesus, your first allegiance comes to God. Before the, your nation, in fact, you're a part of a different nation. Back in chapter 2, verse 9, it says you're a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. This is the, the family of God, the church. You're a holy nation. And as Pastor Sam said last week, that's not talking about America. No matter how strongly you feel about your political convictions, your witness for Jesus is more important. I got a text this week from, I don't know how politicians and salesmen get my, my cell phone number. They do that to you too? I got, and I got this text and, and it said, it was advertising some political talk that was going to be going live. And it said, America first. And the first thing that came to my mind is, no, Jesus first. Now, I, I, I know that different churches have different philosophies and styles and all that. But I've heard pastors say, I've actually heard this said, watched a video of a pastor saying, you can't be a Democrat and a Christian at the same time. That's ridiculous in my opinion, to say something like that. I know a pastor who brainwashed his young son and he would call him into the living room to entertain guests and he would say, son, how do we know if a Democrat is lying? And, and son would, would gleefully respond, because his lips are moving, dad. Come on. I know others who boldly declared that you can't be a Christian and vote for a president who was caught on camera talking about how he could grab women in the privates. I think we should be careful starting sentences, you can't be a Christian if, and then putting something political in that sentence. 
I realize that we all have strong convictions about things. But with Jesus, a you was always more important than a view. He was about people. He cared about people, all people. And, and when we become angry and hateful and we demean or make fun of another political side, we just rule out a chance of reaching lost people for Jesus. I agree with Ed Stetzer when he says, you can't hate people and engage them with the gospel at the same time. You can't war with people and show the love of Jesus. You can't be both outraged and on mission. Which is it for you? Are you outraged or on mission? Because you can't be both if you're going to be effective. Are you aware that some people in our country have actually made politics their religion? Making politics your religion will disciple you into a person of hatred. And it's happening all around us. We've got to be careful. It's not happening to us. Josh Howerton writes, in a secular society, politics become religion. Political rallies become worship services. Campaigning becomes evangelism. Candidates become saviors. You can't love your political enemies because you see them as demons to be exorcised. Maybe I'm making someone mad right now. It's not my intention, but it could happen. Maybe you're thinking of going to another church. After all, we live in a cancel culture. So if you disagree with something I say, you might be tempted to cancel me or cancel Grace Place. I hope not. But it does happen. That's not the spirit of Jesus, though. The religious leaders were all about canceling people that didn't live up to their expectations. And they eventually tried to cancel Jesus on the cross. But Jesus wasn't like that. He welcomed people that others tried to cancel. He refused to play by the rules of the culture because he was implementing a new kingdom with new rules where all people matter, where all people are seen as image bearers of God. What did Jesus say his followers would be known for? He says, you will be known for this. What did he say? Being right? Winning cultural battles? No. He said, by this, all people will know you're my disciples if you love one another. That's it. That's what Jesus said you'd be known for. Love. If you're, if you're following him closely, you're going to be known for loving people. And that's why the early church grew so rapidly and it became contagious because they didn't just talk. They did talk, but they didn't just talk about their faith. They lived it and they loved people. They loved people. That's what made it contagious. They ministered to people who were sick during the plagues when other people had given up on their own family and thrown them out on the street. Believers took them and nursed them back to health and those people became believers. They visited where children were regularly abandoned, which was common practice in those days for unwanted children to be left in the woods for the animals to get them. They visited them. They took those babies and they raised them as their own. They treated women as equal to men and slaves as equal to masters. And they all sat side by side together in those home church environments, which was unheard of in that society. They took care of those who were poor and those who were immigrants, they, they showed love in tangible ways. And Christianity was contagious. It blasted all over the Roman Empire in no time at all until finally the emperor became a Christian. Uh, Philip Yancey writes, human rights, civil rights, women's rights, minority rights, gay rights, disability rights, animal rights, the success of these modern movements reflects a widespread empathy for the oppressed that has no precedent in the ancient world. He goes on to say this, classical philosophers considered mercy and pity to be character defects, contrary to justice. Not until Jesus did that attitude change. This is so uh, um, ironic because there are so many people in our country who uh, are very committed to rights of any minority group, at the same time not interested in Jesus, without knowing that without Jesus, none of this would have been a thing. Before that, it was considered ridiculous 
to give rights to minority groups of any kind. Jesus changed everything. And when his followers lived like him, Christianity became contagious. I say, let's make Christianity contagious again. Amen? Now, in the next verses, Peter goes on to show how living out faith in a hostile world looks. And he begins by talking about the need to submit to proper authority. For the Lord's sake, he says. And he mentions as citizens of the land you live in. And then he talks about employees and employers. He's, he talks about slaves, but the, the application for us is uh, employees. And then uh, next week, we'll get into chapter 3, which is about wives and husbands. And then he goes on to talk about fellow believers and the family of God submitting to each other. That's the theme for the next uh, little stretch of this letter. And we're going to just not look at all those examples today, but we're going to look at two of them. First, we submit to authority as citizens of the land we live in. And so we read here in verses 13 and 14, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor, that would be like the president for us, as the supreme authority, or to governors, we have one of those, who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. This is... This is convicting to me, studying this this week, and I always do a better teaching if I'm teaching it to myself first because I need it. But I, I, I'll confess, I've said some things about the president and the governor that we're not always honoring. And I need to remember that God teaches here and elsewhere that he uses the offices of the land to keep order and we're to respect the office regardless of whether we respect the individual that holds the office. The text goes on to say, we not only submit to authority, but we are to honor them. And, and this, is, this is quite startling uh, when, I, when I read the last part of verses 15 to 17. It says, for it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Whoa. I just had to stop there and say, are you kidding me? Do you know who the emperor was when he wrote this? Peter wrote this in like 62, 64 AD, uh, AD, something like that. We know it was somewhere in that window of time. Well, back in 54, 10 years earlier, the emperor that was cur currently being, he's calling people to honor, was still reigning. His name is Nero. Have you read anything about Nero? My goodness. You might think the previous president was immoral and the current one is losing it. Nothing approaching Nero status. I mean, Nero, here's a, here's a uh, statue of him. This dude was evil. He, he, was, he was murderous. He, his mother and sometime lover, he had killed, sought to poison her. Didn't work. So he tried to get her crushed by a falling ceiling. Didn't work. Tried to drown her in a, in, a, in a sinking boat. Didn't work. So ultimately, he just had her murdered and disguised it as a suicide. He got engaged at 11 and married at 15 to his adopted stepsister. At 24, he divorced her, and that wasn't good enough. So he ordered her bound and her wrist slit and suffocated in a steam bath and had her decapitated head delivered to him in court. He also murdered his second wife, kicking her in the belly while she was pregnant. He spent a fortune building an ornate palace only to have it burned down because he wanted to build a different one. And he probably set the fire himself. And he, he watched Rome burning while he was singing a song. And then he blamed it on the Christians and persecuted them ruthlessly. He was quite a guy. And uh, some of the things he did for sexual thrills were were strange and disgusting. And I could go into some details that I'm not going to go into, but you can look it up if you want to know about it more. 
that's enough of a little picture of, of Nero. Oh, I, and I should add, he would in just a couple years after this was written, crucify the author, Peter. And that's why it just blows my mind to read him here, honor the emperor. I'll confess, I've laughed at a few videos that make fun of the current and previous president. But based on this verse, I hear it saying to me, I have no business posting that type of stuff on social media. What do you think? Christ followers are called to honor and submit to authority as citizens. Also, to submit to authority in the workplace as workers. Now, he addresses this now to slaves in verse 18. And there were 60 million slaves in the Roman Empire, and many of them were believers. So many of those who first heard this letter written as it traveled from one house church to another were slaves. And he speaks to them. But the principle here, this, this word slaves in the Greek is not the common word doulos. For, for, it's a different word which could be uh, literally translated domestic or household servant, because that's what most of them were. He says, slaves in reverent fear of God, submit yourself to your masters, not only to those who are good and considerate, and many of them were in that culture because they relied on these slaves or servants, but not all of them. It says, whether they are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. For it is commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because they are conscious of God. Some of these uh, slaves, household servants, they, they did not have freedom or rights, but they, many of them were treated well and they were educated. Society depended on them. Some of them were doctors, nurses, teachers, actors, musicians, stewards, secretaries. So we can easily apply these same principles to the employee-employer relationship. Some bosses are good and considerate. Some are harsh. And Peter says, if you're mistreated by your master or your boss, consider your witness when you face unjust suffering. Remember who the premier example is of how to face unjust suffering. He goes on to say in verse 20, but how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it but if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. He says, to this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. So now he's going to do what he frequently does in this letter, Peter, and that is go back to the gospel. Just go back to it over and over because everything's rooted in the good news of Jesus and what he's done for us on the cross. And so he, he begins to talk more about Jesus and what he's done for us in verse 22. He says, he committed no sin and, and no deceit was found in his mouth. There's gonna be a number of quotations here in these final verses and they're all coming from Isaiah 53, which is the premier prophecy of the cross in the Old Testament. He says, he committed no sin and deceit and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. Jesus gave us the premier example of how to react to unjust accusations and treatments. He trusted the one who ju judges justly. But Jesus did more than just leave us an example. Thankfully, he did for us what we could never do for ourselves. And Peter goes there in the next verse. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Here we find the greatest motivation for living out faith in a hostile world. It's the gospel. It's the good news. And, and, and it's expressed right here. This is such a profound statement. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross. Wow. 
If that's true, that is the best news that's ever been delivered to planet earth. And I believe it's true. Amen. No greater truth, no greater motivation for living out our faith in a hostile world than the gospel, than that reality. Celine read me a great story this week from a book by Tim Keller called Walking with God Through Pain and Suffering. And I think it's, it's a powerful illustration of what Jesus did when he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross. The story is about a, a famous pastor of years gone by, Donald Gray Barnhouse, he used to be the pastor of 10th Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia for many years. And when his daughter was young, his wife sadly passed away. And he was trying to process the pain of that and at the same time help his young daughter process the morning of losing her mom. And one day they were driving and a moving van passed by them. And as the moving van passed, the shadow of the truck passed over them as well. And he said something like this, would you rather be run over by a truck or by its shadow? And his daughter replied, by the shadow, of course, that can't hurt us at all. And then he said, right, if the truck doesn't hit you, but only its shadow hits you, you'll be fine. And he said, I want you to know that the shadow of death went over your mother. She's actually alive. She's more alive than we are. And that's because 2,000 years ago, the real truck of death hit Jesus. And because death crushed Jesus, and we trust Jesus, now the only thing that can come over us is the shadow of death. And the shadow of death is but the entrance into glory. Amen? He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray. But now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Would you stand with me for prayer? Father, thank you so much for your love for us and for your care for us. Thank you, Jesus, for what you have done for us, burying our sins in your body on the cross, atoning, making atonement for us. What a blessing. I pray that every person here or listening online or watching online would, would open up their hearts to you and say thank you and be grateful and receive the gift of the gospel and be appreciative of it. Lord, forgive me when I have not been a, a good witness for you. I'm so convicted by your word of how important it is. And I pray for, for all of us who are followers of Jesus that we would, this week, that we would be thoughtful of these words that come in the next chapter where it says, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. May that be our approach. We pray in your name. Amen. Let's worship together.